time to work with us through all that. Thank sure, you for no making your presentation today. I uh, just remind remind folks that this is being presented by the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. We're a collaboration of a number of organizations and in, individuals working to figure out how to better uh, improve our process of prairie reconstruction with the hope that with the hope that all of us uh, eventually learn how to do a better job and do more effective and efficient uh, job of reconstructing prairies. So we'd like to thank Peter all day. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, Pete. Yeah. That's perfect. Sounds good, Paul. Giving us this presentation today. And if Pete, if you'd like to, if you want to hit star four, that'll mute us all just to make sure there's no background noise on the report. So go ahead. Wait, Pete. Thank you. Okay. Um, star four, you say? Yes, sir. And then on star four again when you're done, and it'll bring us back on. Okay. There you go. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, like I said, my name is Pete. I teach ecology courses at William Penn University down in South Central Iowa, and I'm going to be talking to you guys today about some of the work that I did for my dissertation when I was doing a PhD at Iowa State. Uh, so how to use bison in reconstructed prairies or what they might do for a reconstructed prairie. So I guess to start off, uh, we got to throw this one out here. Is it bison or is it buffalo? Um, a lot of people ask. Uh, technically, of course, it's bison. That's the scientific name. But if you go all the way back to uh, 1635, the French were calling these animals les bouffes um, back when they first came into North America, which then translated to buffalo. So technically, the term buffalo is is earlier. But Linnaeus coined it as bison, and that's the official one we've got. Um, if you're talking buffalo, at least if you're at a scientific conference, people are going to think you're talking about African Cape buffalo or uh, Asiatic water buffalo, like you see on the right-hand side of the screen there. But, but we're talking about the guy on the left, the, the American bison. So we also have some extinct bison that we find in fossilized forms throughout North America, uh, bison presis or the steppe bison came over from Siberia, inhabited places like Alaska, and these are the ones we find like frozen mummies of up in the permafrost. Uh, we've got bison latifrons, which is a longhorn bison, and then the closest related to our modern bison is bison antiquus, uh, which looked about the same like our modern plains bison, but a little bit bigger. So all of these direct descent or direct line to our, our modern bison today. And then just to give an update on like what kind of bison we have around the world currently, uh, of course, there's the European bison, bison bonassus, or the bison, uh, actually a forest animal, lives in the forests of Poland and parts of Russia. And then we have two varieties, I guess you call them these days, of uh, North American bison. We have our familiar plains bison, which is bison, 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 and then the wood bison, which is bison, bison, Athabasca. Uh, for a long time, they were considered subspecies, some recent genetic work, though, has shown that these guys are just phenotypic variations of the same species, plains being an open grassland type animal and the woodland bison being sedge meadows and the northern boreal forest kind of a critter. Um, in fact, the uh, papers that I've read say there's more genetic variation between breeds of domestic cattle than there are these two once formally subspecies, although they still have subspecies designation for a lot of legal protections and endangered subspecies status and things like that. So just to give some basic background on bison, so everybody's familiar with the animal. Uh, females are generally smaller than males, a lot of sexual dimorphism going on here. So females generally average five and a half feet at the shoulder, about eight or 900 pounds. They're gonna live 20 or 25 years Unlike domestic cattle, uh, they don't reproduce until age three. So they get pregnant at age two, have their first calf at age three, and then generally uh, they're gonna have one calf every other year. So like a 60% a fecundity rate. Uh, they wean those calves at about five to 18 months and a big herd size here. So cow-calf herds run between 60 and 100 animals, give or take. Males are a lot bigger. Uh, these guys are six and a half feet at the shoulder. They're gonna weigh 1,500, maybe even up to 2,800 pounds when they're fully mature. Lifespan's shorter, average is 15 years. You know, these guys get in fights. Uh, they knock each other around. They do stupid things when they're teenage bison and get themselves killed earlier. Uh, generally, they don't reproduce till age five. Now that's not 
physical sexual maturity. They could reproduce at a younger age, but uh, the herd dynamics are such that the older bulls generally don't let the younger bulls get a chance to breed until they're at least five. That's when they're big enough to, to challenge some of the other males. And here your herd size is going to be much smaller. Uh, one, for your real older bulls that kind of go off by themselves and do their own thing, up to, you know, five or so, um, generally similar age class bulls. So these guys are pretty amazing athletes. Um, they look like a cow, but, of course, they can run and jump about like a deer. Um, they can jump six feet vertical, and I have seen bison do that. When they're in a confined situation, they want to get out of a fence. Uh, they can up and over from a standing jump six feet. They're going to run about like a racehorse, 35 to 40 miles an hour. And their only predators are wolves, grizzly bears, and, of course, humans. Uh, if you guys look on this map, um, this is just distribution of both the wood and the plains bison here in North America. So the plains bison, the one we're familiar with, is the black dots. And then the, the white dots indicate wood bison herds. And then the size of the dot is the size of the herds. You can see one there down in south central Iowa. That's Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. And then I think everybody in this group probably knows, but uh, tall grass prairie, of course, covers roughly 400 million acres, or once did, Central North America. And we are the dark green outline there on the, the eastern side where we get more rainfall in places like Iowa and Missouri, Minnesota. So I want to talk a little bit about bison in Iowa. You know, typically we think of bison as out on the Great Plains, which, you know, for ecologists is the short grass prairie. And historically, bison were much more numerous out west. Um, east of the Mississippi River, bison that, you know, explorers and early travelers saw, uh, they were generally in herds of less than 100, and groups of less than 20 animals were commonly recorded. Now, most of those pioneer accounts don't say, was this a bull group, was this a cow-calf group? And even when you're thinking of, like, the vast herds out west, um, at least to my knowledge, nobody ever said, hey, we are got this train that's traveling, and, you know, we stopped for two days to let the bison herd go by. But you know, maybe that was in the end of July, and that was the, the breeding season where all the bison in the entire neighborhood had gotten together. Um, typically, those guys are going to be in smaller groups. Generally, when they get to about 100 or so animals, they start to split off and form smaller groups. So within Iowa, most of the herds were up in northwest Iowa. Um, kind of like a lot of things, that northwest corner of the state typically has vegetation and animals that are um, what you would expect to find farther west, you know, out in the drier regions, the mixed and the short grass prairie. So things like sharp-tailed grouse and white-tailed jackrabbits. Um, those guys are up there in the northwest, too. And most of the settlers actually never saw a bison. So it's estimated that within the first five years or so of settlement, most of the bison, as well as the elk, were wiped out in Iowa. They were just big targets. They were tasty. And when they wandered near a settlement, people would quickly, you know, sound the alert and jump on horses and grab wagons and run out and shoot them down. And, and then there was free food for a long time. So uh, there was some kind of struggle, you know, here and there, sort of remnant herds and, and stragglers. But uh, for the most part, we think bison were extirpated from the eastern and the central parts of Iowa by 1855 and by west, in western Iowa by 1870. And then uh, the photos there and the drawing on that slide, they just depict some guys at a railway station sitting on bison hides there on the bottom. And then the top is... Uh, an old bison hunter doing what they call making a stand on a herd. Um, you guys are probably familiar with herd dynamics in bison. They're matriarchal, much like elephants are. And so if you could get up on a ridge where you could overlook them, uh, you don't just start shooting into a herd. You kind of watch them for a while, figure out who's in charge, find that lead cow. And once you shoot her, the other ones, instead of running off and stampeding, will just kind of mill around and stay in place. And then you could shoot, you know, 10 or 12 more, and that would be enough work of skinning for the day. And so then you and your couple hired guys and your team of mules and wagon, you would start skinning the bites. And then once you got a dozen or so, you're pretty good for the day, and you go back and, and do it all again the next day. So today, when we think of grazing with bison, um, generally that's a practice that we hear about out west, you know, west of the Missouri River. Uh, if we talk about grazing with bison in prairie remnants here in Iowa, um, start to get a lot of funny looks, maybe some gasps from folks like, how dare we think about grazing 
our prairies, and generally that has to do with the size of the remnant. You know, out west they tend to be bigger. There's a historic um, culture of grazing prairies, whether it was, you know, bison originally or in a situation where you got cattle. But here in Iowa, prairie remnants are, you know, your typical your postage stamp remnants where uh, the thought of doing anything that would disturb them um, is alarming to some folks. Um, although I imagine, you know, back in the 1970s, people probably said the thing about same about burning prairies. Um, these days, you know, there may be some room for grazing, even on some of those small remnants, uh, maybe not with bison, but, uh, but definitely mimicking what bison can do. So a lot of your managers then, uh, when you say grazing, they sort of associate that with the destructive overgrazing that we see with uh, domestic cattle and sheep in some areas. So as far as the conservation status of bison today, we've got about half a million bison in public and private herds. Um, sounds like a lot, but you know, even the conservative estimates of the historic bison herds were up around 30 million across the central part of North America. And then uh, when you throw genetics in the mix, it gets even smaller. Um, I always tell my biology students, you know, things were going along fine, and then these geneticists came along, and here in the last oh, 10 years or so, we've basically shaken up all the taxonomy and systematics that we have for plants and animals all over the world. And so uh, a lot of the work that was, came out of Texas A&M uh, that Jim Durr was starting looked at the genomes of bison and found that there was actually a lot of domestic cattle integration and that uh, if we were to like look at public herds and we're in sort of conservation type situations, we probably only have maybe 15,000 bison without cattle genes that are mixed in with them. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is when numbers dwindled back at the, you know, the early 1900s, when we had maybe five or 600 bison left on the planet, a lot of those were rounded up, um, either mixed in with cattle herds or very close by where fences went down and nature took its course and you ended up with hybrids. Um, Bison and cattle are close enough in species that roughly 25% of the time they breed and you can get a viable offspring out of the deal. So these days, if you want to find, you know, quote unquote, pure bison, uh, at least uh, what our genetic technologies allow us to detect these days, um, things that aren't behind fences, you'd have to go here in the U.S. to Yellowstone or out to the Henry Mountains in Utah, which is a herd derived from Yellowstone stock, or Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota. And then up in Canada uh, with the wood bison, there's the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary, Elk Island, Prince Albert National Park, and Wood Buffalo National Park. Uh, of course, there are some uh, both private herds and public herds that uh, don't have cattle gene in integration, but they're not considered free-roaming herds, um, places where they have fences to keep them in. So a lot of people have suggested um, if grazing is good for prairie reconstructions or remnants, why not just use cattle? You know, cattle are easier to get, cheaper, um, less handling. Um, but for a lot of reasons, uh, while they are similar, they're not exactly the same as bison. And you can see some of the reasons listed there on the screen, although one that's not even up there is just the idea that bison are charismatic megafauna, and they are excellent vehicles to get the public interested in prairies and grassland restoration. Um, I know at least in my experience with uh, Neil Smith, National Wildlife Refuge in Iowa. I've had many, many people tell me that either on their trip to Des Moines or on their daily commute, they will, you know, veer off the road and, and go through the refuge with the hope of maybe seeing a bison. And if cattle were out there grazing those prairies, I'm sure they wouldn't do that. So, so bison are a nice vehicle for educating the public about prairies. But uh, when it comes to differences, like I said, herd structure is different, of course. Um, this slide here, kind of like big herd of bison, this is typically what people think of when they think, oh, yeah, I'm thinking about the, the vast bison herds out west. Um, this would be a cow-calf herd. And generally, like I said, this is a roughly 100 or so animals. When they get a little bit more than that, they start to split up. But this would be a lead cow, her female relatives, um, her female calves, and then any males that are up to about three years old. Once they get to be about three, then that's sort of like their teenage years, and they want to go off and, and do their own thing with other males um, and not be around uh, the females and calves. So when you see a small herd of bison like this, um, even from a distance, you can pretty much tell that these are bulls. Um, so this would be a, a male herd. Um, here we've got three animals, similar aged bulls, you know, so like this. 
the three and four year olds hang together and the six and seven year olds will hang together. And then when they get, uh, you know, fairly up there in years, like 13, 14, 15 years old, the, the bulls tend to just go off by themselves, not even really participate in breeding anymore. Uh, when it comes to calving, um, I know as a kid growing up on a, a ranch out in California, come springtime, one of our jobs was to go out and pull calves out of the, the cows that were having trouble because calves were sometimes 80, 85 pounds, and they get stuck, and you'd spend hours out in the mud pulling a calf. Uh, with bison, that does not happen. Um, calves come out at about 40 pounds, and they pretty much hit the ground running. You know, within an hour or so, they're, they're up and licked clean and ready to follow mom wherever she wants to go. So you generally don't have uh, problems with calves getting stuck. Uh, when it comes to water, of course, bison drink water like any animal, but uh, they aren't tied to water like we see with a lot of domestic cattle herds, whereas, um, you know, domestic cows will trample riparian areas and overgraze areas because they don't want to drift too far from water, uh, whereas bison will drink and then wander off. They're sort of, you know, self-sorting. They, they don't really need to, you know, have fences to tell them, you know, go into this paddock or that paddock. They, they uh, wander every day anyway. And there's been some studies with GPS collars on both bison and Angus cattle out of Oklahoma in Tallgrass Prairie uh, where they were showing that. When it comes to grazing, um, bison are primarily uh, gramivores, so they eat grass and sedges, about 95% of their diet. Um, so domestic cattle tend to eat more forbs for broadleaf flowering plants. And then when it comes to winter metabolism, uh, bison are one of our last ice age remnants. I mean, these guys were alive in the Pleistocene and dealt with real cold temperatures and snowy conditions, and they seem to do that just fine nowadays. There was actually a study out of Canada back in the late 70s where they were trying to assess the cold tolerance of various types of ungulates, and they had a, a six-month-old bison calf, kind of like you see here in the, the photo, um, and they had a, a regular Hereford calf, I think they had a Tibetan yak, and then a, uh, a Scottish Highland cattle calf, the, the shaggy ones with the long horns. And they rigged up a system where they were trying to see, well, at what point um, when we lower the temperature does their metabolism kick in? Do they start shivering and, and saying, hey, I need to warm my body up. I'm, I'm below my, my comfort range. And so they were measuring that by carbon dioxide output. And so they said that they got it down to like 20 degrees Fahrenheit and the domestic cattle uh, was starting to shiver and produce a lot of carbon dioxide. So his metabolism was saying, I'm cold, I need to heat my body. Uh, they got it down to around 10 degrees in both the Tibetan yak and the Scottish Highland cow. They opted out, said, hey, it's too cold. And then they said they cranked it down all the way to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is as low as their equipment can get. And the bison calf, six-month-old calf, was still not, you know, thermoregulating to the point where, you know, it said my body's cold. So he's perfectly comfortable at those low temperatures. So we get that massive head. This is basically a snow shovel, a big muscle attached into the shoulder there. And so they can just push away the snow in the wintertime and, and get down to the grass below. And super well insulated. Um, oftentimes will stand into the wind when there's a a blizzard or a snowstorm, um, they don't drift over fences like domestic cattle will. So super winter adapted. And then when it comes to wallowing behavior, now this is something that bison do that cattle definitely don't. So there's been a lot of studies trying to figure out, well, why do bison wallow? Because it's not something that, you know, just the males do. It's, it's the males, the adult females, even the calves wallow um, for various reasons at different times of the year. Um, some of it's just social dynamics, you know, one bison gets down and wallows, and then the other one comes along and says, hey, I'm a bison too, I think I'll wallow. Uh, sometimes it's for dominance displays during the breeding season in midsummer, where the, the bulls will size each other up, and they roll around in the dust and, you know, spread uh, pheromones all over and uh, make themselves look bigger and badder when they're sizing the guy up for the fight. But the most common reason, um, at least in some of the studies I've looked at, is for insect control in midsummer. So to avoid biting flies and, and other insects, they'll dust themselves. But in so doing, they create these depressions, um, bare patches of dirt, which then is sort of like gardening uh, by bison, where other plants have a, stance to, a chance to colonize and, and get in there. So it can increase diversity over a large scale of the prairie. 
And then um, if you're thinking about having bison come and graze your prairie, of course, you got to think about how am I going to manage this herd? Uh, what kind of fencing do I need? It's probably the, the number one thing that people ask about is, you know, what kind of fencing requirements are there? So if you look at the pictures, uh, the one up on the top left, we've got some pretty tall woven wire. Uh, which will work for bison. Um, that's what they have at Neil Smith, although the the height of the fence there is more for the elk to keep them from jumping over than the bison. Um, over there on the top right, we've got some high tensile wire. Uh, a friend of mine, he raises bison in southern Iowa, and this is what he has for fence. So he'll have like four or five strands of high tensile wire, and two of them will be electrified, and that seems to work pretty well. As long as you've got enough room for them inside the fence, enough food, water, salt, things like that, uh, then they don't really have a need to get out, especially if the other bison are on the inside of the fence with them. Um, if you look down on the bottom left-hand corner, this is what a lot of private producers will do. They'll take existing cattle fence, and they'll add some taller posts and maybe put another strand or two of barbed wire on top of that, make it about five and a half feet tall, and that seems to be enough to keep bison pretty happy as long as they've got stuff inside the fence. Uh, what you see down here in the, the lower right-hand corner, probably not going to work for bison. Um, they will jump right over you know, anything lower than about seven feet if they want to get to the other side. Uh, so pretty much anything short of a brick wall, uh, a bison could go through if he wants to, but the trick is keeping them happy on the inside of the fence. And then when it comes to moving them, um, anytime you have to transport bison and move them to a new paddock, um, this is where you know, things get a little hairy. Now, if you do have like an army of employees with horses or helicopters or things like that, you can sort of cowboy bison and get them to go where you want to. But for the most part, it's a lot easier just to, to trick them into going where you want them to go and make them think it's their idea. Um, so I know like at Neil Smith, when they want to, get bison into the corral for the annual fall roundup. They'll put uh, salt blocks in the corral most of the year so the bison get used to coming in and going out of the open gate, and then they just close the gate for a couple weeks or so. Before the, the roundup, the bison are anxious to get back to their salt block, and then when they want them in there, they open the gate, and, and most of the herd will go in, and they can just shut the gate behind them. Um, I've seen plenty of, like, private folks do it with, with corn as a treat, like shell corn, um, where they'll – put it in a five-gallon bucket, you know, maybe give it to them two, three times a year, and, but the bison get used to that treat coming in the white bucket, and then when you want to move them to a new pasture, you open the gate, you shake the bucket, the lead cow comes and follows you, and then the rest of the herd follows her. So pretty easy to move them that way. Most people, when they're uh, putting them in tight quarters, that's the, the toughest part. Um, you got to have solid walls. Um, so that the bison can't see what's on the other side. If they can see the other side, uh, they might have the tendency to want to go through it. And uh, if they can't see the other side, they seem perfectly happy to, to stay within a corral. So that could be like a solid brick wall that they can't see through, or it could be hanging some plastic tarps the day before you round them up. Um, so it doesn't seem to matter as long as they can't see the other side. So what I really want to get to is kind of, you know, what bison do in tall grass prairie ecosystems. So there's been several studies that have noted bison as keystone species. And by keystone, we're talking about, you know, the ecological concept of a species that has a much greater impact on other species and the, the general environment than you would expect for its size. And so bison being big already, um, they've kind of got an advantage here. But for things like uh, the interactions of fire and grazing, uh, for nitrogen cycling on prairies, for wallowing behaviors that create micro disturbances. And then most of my research um, actually focused on seed dispersal with bison in prairies. So for all those reasons, they're considered keystone species. So some uh, studies that are out there have showed that bison grazing in prairies uh, will increase your forbs, remember, so the bison eat mostly grasses and sedges. And so they avoid the forbs, and that gives the, the forbs a little bit better competitive advantage to grow. Um, so you'll see more species richness, you know, different things have a chance to grow, and then also more species evenness, where instead of having, you know, like 80% of your prairie dominated by big blue stem, the bison are eating that grass, and it gives other things a chance to grow. And we also see a, uh, increased structural diversity in grazed prairies. Um, bison are kind of famous for creating grazing lawns. When you burn a prairie, 
all that new growth, that nice tender green grass is rich in nitrogen, and that's like a dinner bell. They are attracted to that and will go back and eat that down to, you know, almost nothing, and then come away for a little while, go back, and eat it some more, but avoiding the forbs that are growing in the same spot. And so you'll get really tall forbs and then really short grass. And then maybe 100 feet away where it hasn't been burned, you've got tall, rank grasses that they don't really touch, um, at least not until winter. Uh, when it comes to winter, they sort of flip-flop, and then they go for quantity of vegetation over quality. Um, here's just a diagram showing some of the bird species that make use of these different um, sort of stand classes of, of grasses and forbs, um, everything from bare to a little bit denser all the way up to really dense vegetation. So your things like killdeer, lark sparrows, and upland sandpipers, they like the, the more open, shorter vegetation, um, all the way up to things like dick thistles and henslow sparrows that like really thick, tall vegetation. So with bison in the mix, especially if you're doing this, you know, burning and grazing interactions, um, you'll get a patchwork of tall vegetation and short vegetation in the same spot. So it can increase your diversity of birds too. And then lots of other things um, have been shown to increase with, with diverse prairies, everything from the, the ruby meadowhawk, dragonfly there, to badgers, pollinators like soldier beetles and monarchs, and snakes like the racer or the bull snake there, um, even chorus frogs have been shown to uh, lay eggs in flooded bison wallows. So in general, we can say that that interaction of bison grazing and periodic fires is pretty important for, you know, restoring functional ecosystems. Um, but the key there is to maintain light stocking densities. Um, you don't want to overgraze your prairie with bison, just like you wouldn't want to do it with cattle. But, you know, this generally reflects the migratory nature of bison and, of course, the vast expanse of grasslands that they had historically. So most people... You know, they, they try to shoot for a stocking rate where you're going to take off about 25% of the above ground biomass every year and then leave 75%. So when I was getting started uh, with my research, one of the things that kind of sparked this idea was um, an, sort of an old now uh, idea put out by plant ecologists called Reed's Paradox of Rapid Plant Migration. And the idea here uh, was that at the end of the last ice age, you had all these um, glaciers melting back and moving northward, leaving these bare areas of scoured dirt and rock uh, that were just kind of ripe for plant colonization. And what they were finding is that plants were colonizing these areas at a faster rate than what you'd expect for just wind dispersal. And so they theorized that you know, big animals like bison or even maybe mammoths um, could have been picking up seeds in southern areas and then transporting them to these bare ground areas and, and basically... Uh, you know, seeding the, the new grasslands there. So I got to thinking, well, you know, if this has evidence for this at the end of the Pleistocene, well, how would it work you know, historically when bison were out on the tall grass prairies moving seeds around potentially? And then on the flip side of that, what happens now when we've largely removed bison from those grassland landscapes? Um, how is that affecting plant colonization? So I had a couple different things that I was studying. Um, seed dispersal routes that I looked at were, number one, epizocori, um, just a fancy word for animal-mediated dispersal on the outside of animals. So those Velcro-type seeds uh, that get stuck to your pant legs when you're hiking in the prairie in the fall or uh, get stuck to bison hair really easily. And then interesting with, like, uh, with bison, of course, not only do they – shed seeds as they're rolling around and, and just bumping against each other, but they also shed big patches of hair, especially in the spring and summer. And a lot of those are full of seeds that they've picked up throughout the year. So sometimes we see that, um, like in the picture there, where they rolled around in a wallow and some of that loose hair comes off. So another route of epizocory for bison. And then I was also looking at uh, endozocory. Not sure what that black screen is there. Okay. Anyway, uh, this is seed dispersal by animals that goes through the inside of them. So uh, things that they eat and then comes out the other end. And typically this had been studied in tropical systems with things like monkeys and large birds. But I was looking at it in a grassland system with, with herbivores. So if you take, you know, your typical prairie grass, this kind of looks like Indian grass here in this cartoon. Um, you guys probably know that the 
area around it um, that has the potential for seeds to disperse to, that's what we call the seed shadow. And some of the research that I did in my lab, uh, looking at heights of plants and wind speed and velocity of drop and things like that, uh, putting to the, those together in models found that, you know, even on really windy days out in the prairie, um, it was rare that uh, these seeds would get over 10 meters away from the parent plant. So a fairly small seed shadow for your average prairie grass. But if you add bison to the equation, uh, this changes things quite a bit. Most plant ecologists um, would say that 100 meters is sort of the threshold for what we would term long distance dispersal. And these tend to be like really rare events, you know, like things, seed dispersal that happens because of a hurricane or a tornado or things like that, actually getting that seed more than 100 meters away from the parent plant. Well, if you put bison in your average prairie, um, a hundred meter seed shadow, that's like right now. You know, they pick up seeds and within minutes they've walked a hundred meters. Now multiply that by the time that the seed stays on the bison, uh, which in some cases is many months. You know, a hundred meters gets exponentially multiplied here um, to the point where, you know, they can go many miles over five or six months before that seed finally drops off. So the, the probability of long distance dispersal uh, with bison is almost 100%. So I'm sure you guys know um, where the prairie is here. Uh, we're looking at the tall grass prairie extent in North America. And here in Iowa, just to show you where I did most of my research was at the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. Um, also did some down at the TNC's Dunn Ranch just over the border in Missouri. But uh, Neil Smith, it's roughly 2,000 hectares. Uh, tall grass prairie, there's oak savanna, there's remnants, there's restoration parts, uh, but my focal area was that 303 hectare enclosure in the center of the refuge that has bison and elk. So this is what it looks like from an aerial view. And when I first started on this project, um, I just sort of had the naive assumption that, well, it's a prairie restoration that's been going on since the, the early 90s. Um, I'm going to be dealing with all native vegetation. But after doing some vegetation surveys for a couple of years, uh, found out, no, that's not the case. Um, got a lot of different patches of stuff going on in here. Um, so if you look at the, the colored patches, the sort of uh, tan color, darker tan, which makes up most of it, that is actual native prairie vegetation within the, the bison area. Uh, then the dark green, sort of linear looking patches, those are treed areas along creeks. The lighter, sort of beige color, also looks pretty linear. Those are open um, waterways, mainly dominated by reed canary grass. And then the light green, which you see up here in the top, and then there's a patch down here, those are remnants of old cattle pastures, uh, mostly brome and orchard grass, and uh, there's a lot of Kentucky bluegrass, and even legumes like red and white clover are mixed in there. Um, the story that I heard um, from folks was that, you know, back when they originally started the refuge, whoever was in charge was worried that the bison might not have enough to eat if all they had was native vegetation. And so they left some of these old cattle pastures in place, uh, which seems kind of strange to us think about it now. Uh, but for better or for worse, now you have this big large scale competition experiment going where we're trying to see, well, are the bison going to spread native seeds into the old cattle pasture? Or are they going to spread non-native seeds out into the, the prairie restoration areas? So that was one of the big questions that I had when I was looking at this. So as I was doing uh, background research for this project, one of the, the papers I came across was uh, Dan Jansen's. Um, this is the dispersal of small seeds by big herbivores, or the foliage is the fruit hypothesis. So Dan Jansen's kind of a more famous for his tropical ecology work, um, the fruit, the gum for years eight, and some of those papers uh, where he was looking at, you know, big giant seeds in the rainforest that were dispersed at one time by now extinct megafauna. And in this paper, he was suggesting that it's not the attractive fruit that the, the animals are eating, but the foliage of the grass, the leaves, which then inadvertently uh, have seeds in them that the bison eat. Um, but even in this paper, he was saying, well, this is just kind of a theoretical idea. Um, nobody would be crazy enough to try to take on this type of field research because it would just take years and years and meticulous seed counting and sorting. And I didn't figure that out or didn't get the memo um, before I started this. 
So I ended up doing years and years of lots of meticulous seed counting as far as this project. But this is one of the things that I kind of had in the back of my mind um, as I was going through this research. So I wanted to know, does this foliage as fruit hypothesis apply in a tall grass prairie ecosystem? So the way we collected data, um, fortunately for me, uh, Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge does a roundup every fall where you can actually get your hands on the bison and uh, give them haircuts. So I was clipping hair from the, the head of the bison and from the, the back of the bison, and this gave me a, a real nice easy way to uh, know what specs of the animal I was taking samples from, the age of the animal. And of course, all that was recorded by the staff, and um, all these animals are microchipped too, so that gives you real detailed data on uh, who you're uh, taking samples from. So over the course of three years, um, we took 183 samples from a variety of calves and yearlings and adults. And this is kind of what the setup looks like there. It's pretty slick. We have these big, giant steel walls, and we've got uh, places where the researchers can collect data, blood samples, hair samples, microchip, uh, do work, and then the bison are right on the other side of the wall there um, when they're getting sorted to go to various facilities or, or back out onto the refuge. So also collected a lot of shed hair, uh, 374 samples of shed hair. Um, had 50 transects throughout the, the bison refuge there. Um, we go collect those once a month and then mark all the, lo the locations with GPS. And then same thing with bison dung. So walk those 50 transects every month and then would pick up any dung on either side of the, the transect for a meter. And then uh, we'd remove all the, the dung from the transect every time so that we wouldn't be collecting from them twice. And then I also wanted to see, well, what's the background seed drain? What kind of seeds are, are dropping on the landscape by wind or by gravity um, and not by bison? So we set up these funnel seed traps, um, basically a PVC oil funnel, you can get in any hardware store. And then we put that almost flush with the ground. We raise it up a little bit, trying to keep the insects out. Um, and then I also put in screens at the bottom. And the idea was to uh, keep, uh, deer mice out. I thought I didn't want mice getting in there and, and eating my data collection. I was going to come back and collect these every month. Although about a week or so after I installed these in all the transects, I got a call from one of the maintenance guys at the refuge and he said, hey Pete, them red funnels that you stuck in the ground, they're rolling all over the prairie. You better come check it out. And so I quickly ran out there and discovered that even though mice could not fit down the funnel, uh, little mass shrews could and you could get like five or six shrews in one of those seed collection funnels and they'd get stuck and they would rot and then they would attract coyotes and coyotes would come and, and dig them up and then chew the ends out of the funnels trying to get to the shrews. So uh, had to go get some big stakes and, and stake them all down uh, so that coyotes couldn't dig them up. And remember the idea here is to try and separate bison mediated dispersal from wind and gravity dispersal by these funnels. But this is what I found the first month that I, I went out to collect them. Uh, fortunately, this only happened a couple times over the four-year study, but he definitely hit the target there uh, with that funnel. <laughs> so then once we uh, collected all these field samples, we'd bring them back to the lab, and then we'd extract seeds from them using magnification or dissecting scopes, and then we'd identify them to species in most cases, sometimes genus, and we classify all the seeds, whether they're native seeds or non-native seeds, and then by vegetation, um, were they were they graminoids, were they forbs, were they trees, uh, things like that. And then seed morphology, you know, were these like sticky Velcro seeds, were they round, smooth seeds, were they, were they wind dispersed seeds, things like that. And then wanted to see, well, if a seed goes through a bison's gut, uh, what's it like when it comes out the other end? Is it still viable? And so we did some randomization of samples and and then took those seeds and grew them in petri dishes uh, in the greenhouse there at the Iowa State campus, um, kept them in summer-like conditions, gave them a 16-hour light cycle, and then we go and count those daily to see um, what percentage of them germinated. And so overall, um, we had a little over 28,000 seeds that we took out of the funnel seed traps, uh, almost 4,000 seeds out of bison hair we clipped during the roundups, um, 
almost 4,500 seeds that came out of shed bison hair and almost 11,000 seeds that came out of bison dung. So about 47,423 seeds that we counted over the four-year period. And so these are some of the results that we came up with. Um, this is looking at the clipped hair that we took off the bison during the roundups. And so we didn't have any significant differences here, but in general, we would say that the, the adult females had the most seeds. And we look at you know, seeds per gram of hair, they were carrying the most seeds. Um, but all the age classes and sexes were kind of similar. And then uh, when we looked at the uh, native versus non-native seeds um, in the fall, uh, when they're in the roundup, there's way more native seeds, uh, which was kind of surprising because um, some of the vegetation surveys that we've been doing show that it was roughly a 50-50 mix of native and non-native vegetation out in the bison enclosure. Uh, but in the fall, we were finding a lot more native seeds stuck to the bison and a lot of forbs too, which is generally what prairie managers want to you know, spread more around of. So uh, looking at some of the, the types of seeds, the species that we found, like I said, adult female bison tended to carry the most. And uh, these are all species that we found commonly on the bison. The only two um, non-native species that we found in abundance were uh, up in the right-hand corner there, Queen Anne's Lace, which is kind of a naturalized pioneer garden flower. That's, you see it in all kinds of open areas across Iowa. And then uh, smooth brome grass from those old cattle pastures that got stuck in there too. So doing some back of the envelope calculations, we figure that you know, your average adult female bison is carrying around roughly 11,000 seeds um, every fall. So kind of like a walking chia pet. When we looked at shed hair, the stuff that we were picking up either just in the grass or stuck on the side of a tree or in a wallow, uh, these were the main species we're finding there. So native grass like big blue stem and Indian grass as well as um, a lot of forbs like asters and soft tooth sunflower. Um, here are the main non-native plants we found were, again, Queen Anne's lace, as well as reed canary grass and Kentucky bluegrass, both sort of remnants from the old cattle pastures. But uh, mainly Kentucky bluegrass and Indian grass were the, the big species, most common species we found in shed hair. And uh, when we looked at the abundance of seeds in the hair itself, um, over various seasons. Um, looks like the midsummer, July and August is when we were seeing the most. And this is kind of reflective of what's available on the landscape. This, these were the, you know, the, the times when reed canary grass was putting a lot of, out a lot of seed, when smooth brome, Kentucky bluegrass were putting out lots of seeds. And then we also were kind of interested in you know, like when is the most shed hair dumped on the landscape? And definitely that, that happens in May. Um, you get it in every month to a certain extent, but, but May seems to be the big one. Um, starting in April, you get a big bump, and then May is the big. Although, interestingly, um, most of the year, what we would find is that brown or light brown body hair. And then in the fall, uh, generally around October, you would see a switch. You'd go out to collect, and it wouldn't be brown hair, but it'd be really dark black hair that we would find on the ground. Um, something that either came from the front legs or the head. And so um, we sort of have this, you know, dual shedding of hair, mostly body hair throughout the year, and then head hair or front leg hair um, in the fall. And some people have suggested that, you know, during the rut in midsummer, the, uh, the hair on a bison's head or his front quarters act like a fitness indicator, a lot like antlers on a cervid. And so uh, having that big shaggy hair throughout the summer would be an advantage if you're trying to, to breed lots of females or, or worn off rival males. Um, but then um, when it's getting closer to winter in October, then they would shed some of that hair and grow in new winter growth. So when we looked at the, uh, the dung, you know, looking at uh, the abundance of seeds in dung, here's a little bit different than what we were seeing in the hair. Um, we've got more non-native seeds showing up in dung uh, and more graminoids, um, mostly grasses showing up here. Um, not so much the forbs that we're finding in the hair. We clipped off the bison in the fall. So these are the common species we saw um, in bison dung. And the most abundant would be things like crabgrass, you know, like you might find in your driveway or your lawn, uh, white clover, common pasture or lawn legume, 
red clover, and then Kentucky bluegrass. So a little, quite a bit of difference here between the hare and the dung. So when we look at, uh, you know, the abundance of, of seeds in dung, we've got a big bump in May and June, and then it tapers off, and then a whole bunch more seeds in the fall. So May and June, we're seeing things like Kentucky bluegrass, and then a C4 grass like crabgrass is showing up in the late summer and fall. And then when we just look at the, the seed abundance um, over the year, looking at these different dispersal types, so wind and gravity, that we collected in the seed traps. The most abundant was midsummer. Um, shed hair, you had a kind of a bump in early spring, and then most of it was also in midsummer. And then in the dung, we saw, you know, sort of a, a late spring, early summer increase, tapered off, and then another big increase um, in the fall. So overall, we can say that, you know, the seed abundance and the diversity, we can explain that pretty much by the phenology of plant growth. And the bison are picking up what seeds are available on the landscape. Um, but one thing that was interesting is the adaptations, you know, the morphology of the seeds that might determine local dispersal. You know, for example, like asters, they're obviously wind dispersed. They've got those little parachutes on them. Um, that may play a subordinate role for long distance dispersal because we found a lot of asters in that fall clipped hair, and they were certainly going much farther um, on the back of a bison than they would even by the wind. Um, in shed hair, though, it was mostly grass seeds. But remember, shed hair is something that, you know, hangs on that bison for five or six months. So those seeds that are attached in the shed hair are either just picked up, like, you know, some non-native grass that was put out seeds in June, or had attached in October and stayed on throughout the winter. So we found a lot of Indian grass and a lot of big blue stem. Um, they've got those little hairs and awns and stuff that really help them kind of burrow down into the hair and stick there. And for anybody that's into fly fishing, uh, when you look at big blue stem or Indian grass seeds under magnification, they look remarkably like a tiny grasshopper. So I've yet to try this, but I really need to stick those on a tiny hook and see if we can catch fish with them because it's almost a perfect invitation when you, when you look at them. Um, and then as far as the dung, the types of seeds we found in dung were really similar to what we saw in the seed traps. So stuff that was just on the ground anyway. But the viability test that we did showed that less than 10% of those seeds were viable. Um, being chewed up by bison and then regurgitated and chewed again and digested um, just didn't do good things for most of the seeds, especially the, the flexible, soft seeds. The, the hard, round seeds like clovers um, did much better. And then we did find some species in our seed traps that we never found in the bison hair or the dung, and those were primarily woodland species, places where the elk like to hang out, but the bison rarely go unless they're just crossing the creek. So we can say that differences in seeds in bison hair and dung um, can be explained by the, the seed release height of the plants. So your tall fruiting plants, you know, your golden rods and, and uh, things like big blue stem, those are more likely to lodge in the hair of bison where plants that put seeds out low to the ground, like sedges, um, more apt to be you know, eaten by the bison. And then the seed abundance in the spring shed hair was much less than fall clipped hair. So about half the seeds uh, that we find in the clipped hair would have fallen out over the winter. The bison are running around and knocking into things. Those seeds are just sprinkling off them onto the snow. So you sort of got a situation where you're looking at bison-mediated frost seeding which if you ask most prairie managers today, how would you, you know, establish a good diverse stand, they would tell you go out and, and do some dormant seeding in the winter. So the bison uh, may have been doing that for a long time. Um, the other thing we found is that bison dispersed seeds uh, through shed, hair, and dung that were outside the normal period of abiotic seed rain. So species we were finding in the dung or the shed hair were not the same things we were finding in the, the seed traps for those months. So they were hanging on to them and, and sort of pushing that seed shadow beyond the normal time that the seeds were being dispersed. So that really long curly hair, it's almost like sheep wool, um, is really good at holding on to seeds of all different morphologies. You know, when we started this project, I thought, well, it's going to be those Velcro type seeds that really stick well. But it turns out virtually anything the bison walk through, um, it's going to stick to them. It doesn't matter if it's a Velcro type seed or a smooth round seed, it sticks in that long hair. So bison might be unique among North American mammals um, for their ability to retain those seeds over long distances. 
So what you could say for sure is that if you add bison to any grassland ecosystem, it is going to profoundly change the scale of seed dispersal. You're moving those seeds at a, a much longer uh, distance than you would normally. And back to that foliage is fruit hypothesis. How did it work out for tall grass ecosystems? Uh, for native grass, we would say no, it didn't. Um, they're eating those native seeds, but they're so soft that they're getting digested and, and they're not coming out viable on the other end. They're also pretty tall for most of them. Um, native forbs, kind of the same thing. Native sedges, however, um, they grow low to the ground and they they're hard, they're compact, they're like little rocks, and they survive digestion really well. So native sedges are uh, definitely fall into this hypothesis. As far as non-native grass, um, yeah, we're looking at lots of Kentucky bluegrass and crabgrass um, being spread by bison dung too. So something to think about if you're managing with bison. And then when it comes to non-native forbs, you know, typically we're seeing the clovers, the red and the white. Although you could probably say the same thing about like bird's foot trefoil. Um, there's actually a rebuttal paper that came out about a year after Jansen's original. Collins and Nuno wrote this. Um, and they were saying that, well, it seems silly um, if your foliage is the fruit. If you're attracting seed dispersers by letting them eat your stems and leaves, you're losing all your photosynthetic ability or most of it. So wouldn't it be smarter? If plants can be smarter to uh, put your seeds into your next door neighbor's foliage. Let him get eaten and then inadvertently get your seeds spread. And for things like those really hard round seeds like clovers, that seems to be exactly what they're doing. Uh, the bison don't eat the forbs, they eat the grass, but if the, the hard round seeds are there mixed in, they just sort of vacuum them up uh, along with everything else. In fact, in the dung, we also found lots of tiny little rocks that were about the same size and shape as those clover seeds. So when it comes to managing, um, some of the implications that you can say that you know, came out of these studies is, you know, if you've got a remnant or a reconstructed prairie that's large enough to have bison, um, these could be a really great way to do effective long distance dispersal, especially for forb seeds um, that you want to get out to other parts of your remnant or your reconstruction, those patchily distributed plants. But if you're thinking about, you know, starting from scratch, it might be a good idea to hold off on the bison introduction and let your prairie become really well established because bison are going to introduce disturbance, you know, whether that's grazing down grasses short after a fire or creating bear patches on their trails or wallowing. And if you're in the Midwest, chances are you've got road ditches or neighboring fields that are full of exotic species um, that would just love to come in and jump on those bare ground sites and start establishing. Um, but if you already have your, your native prairie established, the chances of that are going to be much less. And then uh, if you do have a real problem that you notice, like you go out and you say, well, you know, we just have this infestation of birds with trefoil. You may want to think about chemical control of that before you add bison um, because they do have the ability to disperse just about any kind of seed that's out there. And then if they have access to a situation, well, like down at the Dunn Ranch, uh, the TNC property in Missouri, where you've got reconstructed prairie and remnant prairie that they're on, uh, you may want to think about some fencing options um, during those times of the year when the bison uh, are potentially dispersing non-native seeds, you don't want them wandering into your remnant uh, where they can spread those. So I'm sure everybody can guess um, who said this quote, a famous quote here, what a thousand acres of silphiums look like when they tickle the bellies of the buffalo is a question never again to be answered and perhaps not even asked. Of course, that was Leopold said that in Sound County Almanac. Um, but throughout this research, I kind of feel privileged to be able to you know, be one of those guys that is starting to look at these questions again, um, even though we hadn't for many years. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot away. Happy to take any. Better hit my star here. All right. Anybody there? You got us, Pete? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if anybody has questions, feel free to ask. Great. Thanks, Pete. Yeah.
can put them in the chat box if you'd rather write it, or otherwise, if you'd like to uh, speak up, that can get a little unruly, but um, we can go that route. Uh, Pat, there's, oop, where to go? I saw we had a question pop up. Can you see the questions, Pat? Uh, Pete? I am not seeing them. I'm on the main page, but I'm not seeing questions. It's a little blue button down there. Or, yeah, yeah. There, oh, there you go. go. I'm on the yeah. chat there. I did see one, and I can't see it now. One showed up, and I can't see it. It's uh, Phil Dahl, I think. Can you try that question again, Phil? Make sure if you hit the chat, you maybe make it to all if you don't mind sharing that question with everyone. Are you aware of related seed dispersal research with cattle? Um, yeah, some folks have looked at it with cattle, um, especially in Europe. Uh, they've been doing a lot of this uh, with cattle, sheep, um, even things like red deer, and I think hogs over there. So, yeah, um, folks have been looking at that, too. Um, but like I said, most of it comes out of Europe. Um, haven't seen much else. There's been a couple other bison projects here in North America, um, one down in Oklahoma. That's a tall grass prairie preserve there. And then one on some islands off the coast of Southern California, where actually bison aren't really native, but they got put out there for a, a movie in the 20s and left there. And so, um, yeah, you're seeing some stuff there, but most of the, the seed dispersal with domestic animals is in Europe. Can you categorize the, whole difference. Uh, the answer to that at all? What kind of what the, the difference is? Oh, um, in general, bison are moving more things, greater quantities of things, for sure. Um, yeah, the other species with shorter hair are limited in what they're moving around. Um, but you got a whole kind of different dynamic there where, like, you know, they have grazing of domestic animals in national parks and stuff, or a lot, a lot more altered landscapes in Europe. But yeah, in general, um, and bison are are one of the better ones, and even among native animals. Um, we did a little side project here with um, one of my undergrad techs, where we were looking at the seed dispersal abilities of things like red fox and badgers and cottontail rabbits and things like that. And uh, bison was by far the, the best at retaining seeds and moving them around, more so than all those other animals. Didn't know Neil Smith had a, a fox roundup to get a hair sample. Well, we, we did some artificial type of things. We weren't using foxes, <laughs> live ones anyway. We used fox fur. Uh, I did see another question pop up, and they're they're just kind of coming to my screen, and they disappear. Yeah, okay, you can see them. I'm not seeing them, but but go ahead, Paul. I, I did. I, I saw it came up while you were talking, and it went away before I had a chance to ask you to write it down. So if we, somebody can post that again, that would be helpful. Again, if you're welcome to try uh, answering or asking directly over the phone. Yeah, sure. Any reason to think bison uh, with cattle and mDNA would act any differently? No, we haven't found any. In fact, I've only seen one paper that addressed it, and the main conclusion they came to is that bison with cattle integration are slightly smaller than bison without. But you know, even depending on where bison without cattle integration um, live, it can. It can change that. Like the bison on Antelope Island out in the Great Salt Lake in Utah, um, they tend to be smaller because um, they've been on that island for a while. So, yeah, we, we don't know anything specifically. I mean, there's all kinds of questions that pop up, like, you know, would they be less, you know, cold tolerant or, you know, could they have different metabolism or different breeding cycle or things like that. But um, so far we haven't found any. And the amount of cattle genes that we've detected in bison tend to be really small percentages, too, at least in the wild ones. I mean, they just look like bison. So I guess potentially there's a difference, but we haven't really been able to detect it yet. And do they, are their eating habits any differently? Would that uh, influence maybe what gets transmitted through the dung? 
Sure, I suppose, yeah. I mean, because domestic cattle definitely uh, eat more forbs than bison do. Um, so there's possibility there. But like I said, nobody's really studied it specifically. And do bison tend to congregate in the old pasture areas in winter? That was another question just popped up. Um, at least with our study, the bison pretty much followed the, the nitrogen source. So we had a mix of those cool season cattle pastures, and they would just hang out there early in the year, like, you know, March and April, when it was greening up, and they would ignore the, the native vegetation. And then as the summer progressed, uh, the warm season grass would, would grow, and then they would switch, and they'd be out in the, the native vegetation. And then sometimes in the fall, when it cooled down again, you get another flush of growth in the cool season pastures, and then they would go back there and spend most of their time. Um, so, yeah, pretty much just especially the cow calves, you know, where they're either pregnant or they got nursing babies, they're following the nitrogen source. They want the most nutritious thing possible. Bulls, on the other hand, could probably care less. I mean, they're more about qual or quantity over quality of, of forage. You know, so they will they'll just stay in one spot all day and just eat and eat whatever's in front of them, whether it's, you know, good nutrition or, or just not. Yes. Uh, so another question came up was, what do you want to study next? Oh, um, well, I've actually got a lot of projects going with students right now. Um, I've been doing a lot of oak savanna research lately, looking at um, sort of like um, how management of overgrown savannas affects wildlife populations, diversity, and abundance. That's sort of my main project right now. Um, I've also been doing some stuff with um, – uh, reptile and amphibian diversity and abundance in, in bison grazed prairie remnants versus ungrazed remnants. So, yeah, that's the main areas I've been working on lately. So, Diane, I saw another question for you. I want to see if I got this right. Do um, you think there'd be a difference in the dispersal characteristics of the patterns if you studied bison over a larger area? Oh, yeah, possibly. Um, like I said, we had uh, 303 hectares there. It's actually a little bit bigger now. They've added um, some new fenced areas for them. But, uh, yeah, potentially we might see differences if you had patchier vegetation or bigger areas, things like that. It would definitely be something fun to study in a large area like the Henry Mountains of Utah or Yellowstone um, where you're tracking them over longer distances. Any more questions? Like I would be. Do you have any results from the uh, the herp study of bison wallows and herps yet? Or the bison? Um, yeah, we weren't looking at wallows specifically, but just um, the effects of grazing. Um, in general, the grazing doesn't hurt the diversity of like snakes and frogs and turtles and things like that. Um, seems to be about the same diversity, but the abundance in ungrazed pastures seems to be a little bit higher. I think they like the, the thick cover, you know, probably for, you know, predator avoidance and thermal regulation and, and things like that. But uh, we're just getting started. We've only got one year's data collected, so it'll be a multi-year project. We'll see how it goes in the next couple of years here. Yeah, well, let's maybe have to have you come back and talk about that when you're a little farther along. Sure. Yeah, it could be fun. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions, Pete, so I think we should go ahead and wrap it up. I'd like to thank everybody uh, for sticking with us there at the beginning, especially when we were getting things worked out. Uh, I hope everybody had a decent experience. Um, all the indications are that this one was being recorded, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, we'll get this one archived as soon as we get it all converted and cleaned up and all that kind of stuff. So, Pete, if you don't mind hanging on just a little bit longer, we'd like to sure. say again thanks to everybody for uh for sticking with us and, and viewing the webinar. I hope you'll come back and see us later on for our next webinar.